Because one of the things that uh, I think will become more and more common in a few years, and if you have listened carefully to Mauro Giacca speaking yesterday, is that we are finally reaching a point where there are a lot of possibilities of translating the basic science in RNA research to the patients. And this is something that I can assure you was not very common in the last uh, 20 years or so, right? Before you could explain why people got sick, why they fell ill, but you couldn't do anything about it. And this was kind of annoying because, you know, people who have diseases, they don't really care that you explain to them why they have the disease. The all they want to know is if you are going to find a cure for that disease, right? So, Mauro with his story of microRNAs, and now you see also the story now that I'm going to tell you about pump disease. Well, this story really take home more than magical theories or hypotheses are a kind of uh, path from basic science to uh, actual uh, employment in the bedside. Right? Now, uh, this is a story that started in our lab several years ago, uh, because our lab, and <coughs> Tito Barale's lab uh, before me, was always very interested in understanding the role of splicing errors in disease. So, if you think about uh, the sources of error in eukaryotic protein synthesis, you can see that there are several. They start from transcription, they go to post-translational modifications, and at every stage of this uh, kind of uh, life cycle, uh, you can have sources of errors, which of course are often translated in human diseases. So for many years, most of our lab was actually focused on understanding how often splicing errors occur in human disease. Because you can imagine that because most of our genes are interrupted by introns, coding genes are interrupted by introns, if you have a mistake in the splicing process, of course the, pro the protein will not be made and you will have uh, uh, a misfunctional uh, cell. So, uh, the after a long time, uh, what we did find uh, is that if you look at splicing uh, mutations in different types of diseases, all kinds of diseases from <coughs> monogenic disease like cystic fibrosis to cancer to neurodegeneration, like I told you in the first talk, the percentage of splicing mutations is a little bit uh, varying. So, splicing mutations are present everywhere but they also go from as low as 3% to up to 50% now for some genes. And this very much depends on some gene-specific uh, uh, conditions, like the number of introns or how complex the gene is. Of course, the more complex, the more likely that the mutation is going to disrupt uh, uh, a splicing processes, and also for some uh, characteristic in their sequence. Now, what happens when you have a splicing mutation? Because this is also very important if you want to try and think of ways of correcting it. Well, very simply, you can see here all the elements that determine whether an exon is included or not. So you have the splice sites, you have the splicing silencers and enhancers that Marco Varalle told you about uh, in his talk. And if you have mutations in any of these elements, you have a certain number of events that can occur. Right? So the most likely event is that when some of these elements are mutated, the exon is not recognized anymore. And so you have what is called exon skipping. If you are lucky, the exon is in the upstream and downstream exons are still in frame, so you don't have the creation of a premature stop codon. You will have the production of a protein that is missing the sequence information contained in this exon, but it will not be degraded by NMD. Of course, what you have to be lucky is that the missing information will not impair protein functionality. And this, you know, is often the case. But exon skipping is absolutely the most common defect that you can see when uh, uh, you have a splicing mutation in these elements. You can also have several other events which 
very often after uh, uh, exon skipping are called uh, scripting splicing activation. So let's say that you, you lose uh, the recognition of the five prime splice side, but everything else remains uh, more or less the same. What the splicing machinery will do, it will look around for a similar sequence to the lost five prime splice side and will choose that sequence as a working five prime splice side. So instead of having a nice exon being included, you can have either a truncated version, if that five prime like sequence is in the exon, or an inclusion of a little bit of the intron if the sequence, the five prime like sequence is present there. And normally what happens is that this either takes away a little bit of the information of the exon, it can cause a frame shift most of the times, or it can add some I would say random information that normally would have been contained in the intron. There are also some other changes, like for example intron retention. If the introns uh, between the upstream exon and downstream exons are very small, sometimes the splicing machinery can directly jump right, from uh, uh, one uh, exon down to the other and it will keep the introns or either one or two or both of them. So always, uh, you know, causing what I've told you before, either a frame shift or the introduction of uh, amino acids that really shouldn't be there. Now, uh, in Pompe disease, uh, uh, for reasons that I'll show you a little bit later, these plastic mutations are very common. So first of all, before we go to the plastic mutations, just let me give you a brief introduction to Pompe disease. And the reason why we decided to choose this example out of the thousands and thousands of examples to try a splicing therapy. So Pompe disease basically is a problem at the level of the production of uh, the uh, enzyme acid alpha glucosidase. Pompe disease is a lysosomal storage disorder. Why? Because this enzyme is responsible in our cells for, to break down glycogen. So you know that glucose for our cells is highly toxic. We cannot store glucose as a monomer molecule in our cells because they will die very, very quickly. So what all our cells do is to take the glucose and polymerize it into glycogen. And when you need the glucose, what the enzyme GAA enzyme will do, it will break the glycogen and free the single glucose molecules. Now glycogen, opposed to glucose, is not at all toxic. It's perfectly <coughs> compatible with cell life. But when you cannot break it down, what happens is that glycogen will start to accumulate in the tissues and it will act as a kind of physical uh, 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 the defect at the level of uh, uh, tissue functionality. And where does this happen in Pompe disease? Well, of course it happens in the tissues that need most glucose of all, and that is the skeletal muscle. Now, the interesting thing about Pompe disease, eh, and this is also you know, something that is not very common, is that you have two types of Pompe disease. You have a very severe infantile form, eh, where until a few years ago, the babies that were born with this infantile form of Pompe disease died after a few months, without any exception. And then you have a late form of the disease, which normally occurs at 40 uh, or around 50. And in both forms, what you have is an accumulation a pathological accumulation of glycogen in the skeletal muscles. The only difference between the two forms is that for reasons that are still not very known, the late onset form does not have any cardiac involvement. So the infantile form, the, infantile, uh, the infants die because of cardiac insufficiency, because you have glycogen accumulation also in the heart. In the late onset form, the accumulation occurs in the skeletal muscles, like in the infants, but there is no cardiac involvement. And the other thing that is interesting for this disease is that because it's so important, we make a huge amount of this enzyme in our cells. We make a lot more amount of enzyme than it would be needed 
Okay, so what happens is that if I was to make a GIA enzymatic assay in all the people in this room, what I will find is that there is going to be a huge difference between different individuals. And it's only when the enzyme production drops down to 30% that people become at risk of developing the late onset form. Even if you have less than 30%, you can still have a chance of being healthy, depending if you have protective factors in your genes or not. And it's only when you go down to 1% or 2% of the average normal amount of GA that is produced that you are at risk of developing the infantile form of the disease. And for a therapy, this is wonderful. Why? Because you don't need to recover full enzyme functionality. If you have somebody that has one or a small child that has one or two percent, and you can increase the amount of production by even just 10 or 20 or 30 percent, the child will be perfectly healthy. You don't have to go up there, right? And if you have a late onset form where maybe you are falling somewhere around 10 or 20 percent, you maybe need even less to bring the amount of enzyme uh, at, I would say, normal range. So this is great because you don't have to worry about how efficient you should be. You just need to be sufficient enough to go across this very low threshold. Okay? So are there available treatments for Pompe disease? Well, before 2006 there were not. Okay? Very palliative treatments. The infants unfortunately died very early and there was nothing that could be done. After 2006, of course, uh, with uh, the great, uh, uh, I would say, development of the biotechnology industry that Mauro Giacca told you in the introduction, you now have the uh, replace enzymatic replacement therapy. So you make the enzyme uh, in CHO cells, you purify it, and you give it to the patients. This is fine, it works okay, it's wonderful, but has two major drawbacks. First of all, it's extremely expensive. And you know that in a world of budget cuts, right, uh, making this recombinant protein can be a big burden on a lot of health systems around the world. In addition, if you have to give a recombinant enzyme that works very well, has really no uh, major drawbacks, but it's a big difference if this enzyme you have to give it to a child or to another, right? If for a child you need a lot less, it's much easier to perfuse it in the muscles of the child. For an adult, you need a lot more quantities and the muscles are not so easy to perfuse with the enzyme. So you need alternative therapies. And some alternative therapies, because you have so many uh, mutations in the gene will be focused at uh, trying to recover functionality of the endogenous gene. So a lot of people look at, for example, mutations that uh, cause an amino acid change, a misfolding of the protein, they look for chaperones that are capable of restoring the correct folding. But in our case, what we did, because we are an RNA-based lab, was to focus on a particular intronic mutation, this change in the 3' splice site of exon 2, and the reason why we decided to focus on this change is because most people who have late onset disease, what they do is they have an allele that is completely inactivated because of any kind of mutation, right, at whatever level, and on the second allele they carry this intronic substitution near the 3' splice site of exon 2. And I'll show you what the substitution is, where it is exactly in a minute. And the reason why, of course, they develop the late onset disease is because until they are, when they are young, this intronic substitution still allows proper splicing, because when we are young, everything works better. As you get older and everything starts to work less efficiently, they cannot 
correctly process the GIA, GIA pre-mRNA, they cannot make enough enzyme, and they just fall below that 30% threshold that is the minimum amount before you can develop the disease. Now, why is exon 2 recognized not efficiently? There are two reasons. First of all, because exon 2 is abnormally long. So most of, of our exons are around, uh, are about around the range in 150 nucleotides or not. And why is this? Because this is the optimum distance where if you have molecules that have to recognize the 3' splice site and the 5' splice site, they have to talk to each other, and 150 nucleotides is nice. Right? They do this very easily. If you have a, a lower sequence, there is a problem because they start to interfere with each other binding, and this is why short exons also are not favored by evolution. But if it's much wider, then it's also a problem because they can bind very efficiently, but then they have a problem right, reaching out to each other. So J exon 2 is more than 500 nucleotides long, so three times the normal amount of a human exon. And this means that it already starts off, you know, not being easily recognized by the splicing machine. The other reason why exon 2 and why this substitution is so severe is because it has a lousy 5' splice site. So at the 5' splice site, you have a certain number of molecules that need to recognize the exon. There is, first of all, U1 as an RMP, and then in the later stages of splicing, there is U5 and U6. And you can see that if this is a perfect donor site, so you have all the possible uh, connections between U1 as an RMP, U5 and U6, that are nicely conserved and uh, working, in the donor site of exon 2, you can already see that there are problems with the recognition of U1 SNRMP. Some of the nucleotides cannot be spared with U1 monuclear RNA. And then you have also problems when you have to, in the later stages of splicing, recognize the 5' splice site by U5 and U6. So you have these two major, uh, I wouldn't say defects, but characteristics which makes it that if you, the only thing that is keeping this exon 2 included in our genes is really a perfect 3' splice site. And the mother certain mutation is right in the polypyrimidine tract of the 3' splice site. And what it does, it will lower in a critical manner the efficiency of this 3' splice site so as to make uh, uh, for the splicing machinery very hard to recognize this exon. Okay? So, this normally, this is a change that in most uh, human exons would have no effect whatsoever on splicing. In this case, it has an effect because of this abnormal length and very low quality 5' splice site. So, to answer, when you look for splicing mutations, why is it difficult to predict splicing mutations? Because you cannot just look at the change and decide this is going to affect splicing. In some exons, it will affect splicing. In some others, maybe it will not. And everything depends on the local context, right? Which is sometimes on, the only way to find it is to make experiments. So what happens when you, in these patients? So these patients can, of course, make a very small amount of normal uh, RNA because this reprise splice site is not totally inactivated by this mutation but they also make uh, several species that do not allow the production of the GAA enzyme because in the exon 2, there is the start, uh, the start site. And these changes you can see here, of course you have exon skipping, and you have a little bit also of cryptic exon activation. But you know, that, that, you know, that's not really, it's not really important for my story. You just, Take in mind that you have many, the exon 2 is not properly recognized. Why does this mutation work? This is something that we published in 2014. Uh, and basically, we found that, as expected, this mutation is nothing very strange. 
there is a U265 protein that is binding to the polyprimidine poly tract and is eventually mediating the recognition of the 3' splice site by U2 SNR. This protein, when the 3' splice site nicely binds, uh, is when the 3' splice site has a T nicely binds, when there is a G, it doesn't bind anymore. Now, we wanted to study, of course, the characteristic of this plastic event, because this is the only way that you can start planning for a therapy. And so we, you can look at patients, but patients are very difficult to work on. And you can, uh, what you can do, on the other hand, is to develop a system, a managing system, where you reproduce what you see in patients. So in patients, what you see, you have uh, this, this compared to normal controls, right? In patients, you have no production of the uh, full enzyme because there is no recognition or very little recognition of GA exon 2. In controls, uh, on the other hand, healthy people, exon 2 is very well recognized. But you see that also there are some misplacing events. So this tells you already that in, even in normal conditions, this is a very hard exon to be recognized by the splicing machine. What we did, therefore, as a first step, is to make a managing system. So take uh, a DXM2 sequence, a little bit of the flanking intronic sequence, put it into a plasmid, transfect the plasmid into cells, and see if we get the same pattern. And indeed, with some minor differences, what we saw is that if you have a normal preprimed site, you have normal inclusion of exome 2 If you have the mutation that changes the G, the U to a G, you have no recognition of uh, exon 2 whatsoever. And then you can use this system, first of all, to test, for example, for factors that are capable of either improving or uh, increasing the skipping of exon 2. And I will, make, I will make this a very long story short because it's been published uh, some, a while ago. When we tested several factors, what we found was that a particular protein, SRP75, or a SARS-4, like they're called now, was capable of restoring a little bit of normal exon 2 inclusion in the presence of the mutation. Now, what we did, of course, is to validate the importance of this factor. So if you overexpress it, you have more exon 2 inclusion. If you downregulate it, you have less intron 2 inclusion. And then we looked for compounds that uh, were capable of increasing the concentration of this factor into cells. There were several compounds already described in the literature to affect the concentration of this factor. We tried a lot of them, and we found that one in particular, resveratrol, when it was added to cells, it was capable of stimulating the production of this specific factor, and this increased production was able to improve the amount of exon 2 included in patient fibroblast, it was able to improve the production of the uh, GAA enzyme in the patient fibroblast, so normal GAA enzyme, and this enzyme was also active because its enzymatic activity was, could be improved in the fibroblast of the patient. So these very early experiments told us that you can, in theory, use small molecules to affect all the factors that can influence exon 2 inclusion and therefore could be eventually used as a therapeutic uh, compound. And I'll show you what are the latest developments in this direction. There are also other ways of uh, uh, improving the inclusion of exon 2. For example, by looking for negative factors which may be binding within its sequence and which could bind the negative splicing regulators so that to make worse the effect of the splicing mutation. And therefore, if you want to act on these factors, so instead of acting on factors that are positive, you want to act on factors that are negative, what we have to find, first of all, is where these factors are binding. And this, we did this, or, or uh, still through the mini-gene, we made lots of deletions inside exon 2, and what we checked is which of these deletions helps the recognition of exon 2 by the splicing machinery, and of course, which does not help. 
So where is the region where SRS4 probably is binding? And by doing this analysis, what we found is that there were two regions that were, uh, when they were deleted from exon 2, they caused an improvement in exon 2 inclusion, both for the wild type exon 2, but especially for the exon 2 that carried the minus 13 mutation. And then there was also one region where, where when it was deleted, it completely abolished the exon 2 recognition. Uh, both in the wild type and in the mutant. So this is probably where SRC4 is, is binding, and we found out by making pull-down analysis, so something very similar, but a little bit more ancient than what Alina told you earlier on in the course, where we basically took the RNA of these deleted sequences, and we looked for the RNA binding proteins that are binding in these regions. So we found that in the silencer regions, there was binding of lots of HNRMP proteins that have already been described in many systems to affect negatively uh, the, the, the splicing process. And in the case of uh, the enhancer, I don't think I have the sequence here, uh, we found SRS4 as we expected. And then, of course, uh, what can you do? Of course, you cannot. If you want to make a therapy, you cannot make a deletion in the gene of the patient because it will improve exon 2 recognition, but you have taken out uh, part of the protein sequence. So what you can do is to use a technology that, uh, uh, that is based on antisense biology. So basically, you take an antisense oligo that has a modified chemistry, so it's not degraded very efficiently by the cell, and you target these oligos to the sequence where you know your negative factor is binding. So you prevent this negative factor from binding, and you improve the recognition of the exon 2. Does it work? Well, one has to make many tries, but for one particular silencer region, you can see that if you take three oligos that have been designed, designed to anneal in these particular regions, and you put them all together, in the, in, in, the, uh, in the presence of the mini-gene, the presence of the binding of these three oligos causes an improvement in the recognition of exon 2 compared to the mini-gene where, uh, uh, where there is the mutation of the minus 13. Just the mutation of the minus 13. Uh, we also tried, you know, a few other uh, regions in there, but the, the ones that I've just shown you is absolutely the best one. So does it work in the patient fibroblast? And the answer is yes, because if you take patient fibroblast where uh, they have one allele completely inactivated, the other allele with a minus 13 mutation, and you treat them with the antisense morpholine oligos, you can see that these patient fibroblasts, they recover the uh, exon 2 inclusion compared to no inclusion when they are left alone in the cells. They actually uh, have an induction of uh, uh, exon 2 uh, binding and also they have an increase in the small production of GIA enzyme and this increase also is translated in an increase in enzymatic activity that is statistically significant. But then you come to a problem when you do this uh, uh, work. Well, the first problem, of course, is how you're going to put these oligos inside the muscles. But before you actually get to that point, the, if you remember what I told you about the disease, the problem is not really that you lack the uh, GIA enzyme in the patients. The problem is that you accumulate glycogen. So when you are planning for a therapeutic approach in any of the systems that you're studying, what you do is you want to have a system, a model system, where you can reproduce what is exactly the problem in the patient. And in our case, the problem in the patient was the glycogen accumulation. Now, fibroblasts are fine, fibroblasts from patients, but the problem with the fibroblasts is that they don't accumulate glycogen. They have a very nice uh, uh, system of degraded glycogen 
even in the absence of GAA enzyme or, or of a lot of GAA enzyme, and therefore they, their metabolism allows them not to accumulate the glycogen. So what we had to do is to take the fibroblasts and actually cause their differentiation in myotubes, right? because myotubes accumulate glycogen. And so we had to set up uh, an entire system where we got the fibroblast from the patients and through the induction of uh, uh, several genes that are important for muscle differentiations, we got to a point where in culture cells we didn't have fibroblast, but we had real or similar muscle fibers that you can see have the classic appearance of muscle fibers, so they have a syncytia. Uh, they, can, uh, they can express uh, uh, muscle cell specific uh, 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 genes and they accumulate glycogen when these cells are made from patients. So what happens when you take these cells and you treat them with a morpholine oligonucleotide, okay, you can see that the morpholinos are quite efficient in decreasing the amount of glycogen accumulation in the patient cell. This is fine, we were all very excited. We wanted to patent these oligonucleotides, but like Mauro told you yesterday, not all stories have a happy ending. And when we made a search for uh, patents already present uh, that dealt with antisense oligonucleotide technology on GAAX2, what we found is that some people in the United States, without doing any of these assays, just by doing a very random screening or blanket screening of GAAX2 sequences, they had already patented one of the sequences of this, uh, uh, of this oligonucleotide. So there was really no, we're now connecting this uh, 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 company that patented this oligonucleotides and we are trying to work with them to see if, this, if they're interested to develop this approach a little bit further. And so what we did, oh by the way, uh, before we, we go to the last part, uh, if you think that these uh, uh, oligonucleotides would be useful only for this particular mutation, well think again, because uh, Lorena Mosco in our lab, what she did in the last two years is to test a lot of mutations that uh, can affect or probably affect splicing in the GAA exon 2. You can see them all listed here. And she found several that are not very severe, which if they are present and in the mini gene and you add the antisensor oligonucleotides, you can recover functionality. So antisense oligonucleotide technology targeted against sinusal sequences can also be used for other uh, splicing affecting mutations in the GAA gene. Not for all of them, because if you have some very severe mutations, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the oligonucleotides have no effect. So don't think that if you do this approach, you have a magic bullet that can you know, affect any splicing mutation in the exome. So, after this little bit disappointment that we had already been schooled by another company, what we said, okay, let's go back to the initial studies we did on resveratrol. Um, can we improve them in some way? And, uh, of course, resveratrol is not a wonderful amount, a, a compound to give to a patient because although it is FDA approved, you can find it in red wine, right? The more red wine you drink, the more resveratrol you, 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 you can intake. It has some quite severe side effects if you, not, also if you drink a lot of wine, but also if you take resveratrol as a compound in very high quantities, right? So what we decided to do is let's look for other small molecules that may be useful. And what we did uh, is to take advantage of the high throughput facility here in Trieste where you can actually screen for many compounds at the same time. Now, the big uh, challenge, and this is what Luca and, and was telling you yesterday, when you, have, when you want to make a high throughput approach, is that, again, you need a, a model system that you can adapt for automatic screening. And the minigene is not wonderful. The minigene that we have used in the previous studies I've shown you, 
is not a great uh, idea because it's difficult to then amplify and look what is being amplified. So we decided to change managing and make a fluorescent-based managing. So basically, you take a fluorescent protein, EGFP, there's commercial plasmids available that have it, you basically cut it in half, you make two artificial introns, you stick the exon 2 in the middle, right, and then you transfect this construct into cells, either wild type or carrying the nano mutation. So, if you have a wild type uh, 3 prime splice site, there is very little formation of green fluorescent protein. Why? Because the exon 2 will be efficiently recognized, the two half of the EGFP will not be able to join up, and therefore very little fluorescence will be observed. If you, on the other hand, have the minus 13 TG mutation, this will induce a lot of exon 2 skipping. The splicing will be able to join efficiently the first half of the EGFP with the second half, and you have cells that have a lot of fluorescence. So what you want, so once you make a stable cell line, so a system where all the cells can express either the construct carrying the mutations or the wild type, of course we were interested in the construct carrying the mutation, what you can do is you can screen for thousands and thousands of compounds and you can look for the compounds that increase the fluorescence and the compounds that decrease the fluorescence. Um, and what do they mean? What, what do these compounds mean? Well, the ones that decrease the fluorescence are the ones that are more interesting from the point of view of the therapy. Because if they decrease the fluorescence, it means that they are improving the, the inclusion of exon 2 in the presence of the mutation, and therefore they can restore splicing. If they decrease, if, if on the other hand, if they increase the fluorescence, what this means is that they are making this splicing inclusion worse. But this could also be important, because you know, you want to know which compound may make a certain disease condition worse, right? Because then you can avoid to give it to the patients if, if uh, possible, if at all possible. And so we have done this screening. We have several compounds that we're testing them. Uh, for reasons of intellectual property, of course, I cannot show them to you. But what I can show you is a similar approach uh, that instead of looking for compounds, what we were uh, interested, because we, we had the possibility, thanks to Luca, is to look for factors that are actually binding to the exon 2 and are capable of improving or, uh, um, or inhibiting the inclusion of this exon to see you know, if uh, the earlier work that we had done entirely on the bench side could be reproduced in a much better way using these high throughput systems. And the answer to this is yes, because you can see here from this analysis, we tested uh, uh, not as many as Alina told you, but we tested a few hundred known RNA binding proteins to see their effect on splicing of exon 2 in the presence of the mutation. Uh, it, oh, in this case, it was the wild type. In the, in the wild type exon 2, you can see that there is a SARS-4 here as a positive compound, so as a compound that can include, uh, can cause a better inclusion of uh, uh, the, the GIA exon 2. But also, what we now did, in addition to the HNRMPs that we identified using a very simple food analysis, what we have now found is also a set of uh, factors, cellular factors, that can severely inhibit exon 2 inclusion, whether in the presence of the mutation or not, and we're also trying to see if maybe by silencing these factors we can recover now exon 2 inclusion. Uh, this is just to tell you uh, how nice uh, uh, it is to have a high throughput system, because if you remember resveratrol, we had to try it by hand on the bench, but if you have a 
Hyperboost system that is working, and this assay tells you that it is working, what you can do is you can already you can test for thousands of compounds, different compounds. This is a library that we purchased where all these compounds are FDA approved. So if there is any compound that is effective, we can simply bypass all the animal model studies and we could, if in the ideal world, we could just go straight to the clinical trials. And, uh, and there are more, more, there are several libraries that you can buy depending on what you want to do with them. And uh, you can test, uh, you know, something that it would be impossible, or it would take the lifetime of a PhD student, uh, basically, <laughs> to, to test. So, so this is the, this is basically the conclusions of my talk, uh, and this is something that uh, is a kind of a flow chart uh, that you know, using our experience in JXON2, we managed to kind of. Uh, set up. So basically, if you want to approach an RNA-based therapy, the things you have to do is, first of all, you have to find ways of modeling the defect that you want to, uh, uh, you want to try and correct. You have to model it maybe in such a way as to allow hot throughput screening, because there are several advantages over what we have been doing in the last 20 few years. You have to set up models where you clearly see and clearly can measure what is the real cause of the disease. And then you can use all these different approaches, so using mini genes to the uh, deletion, mini genes and deletions to dissect the splicing uh, regulatory regions, the repressors, the enhancers. You can uh, also screen it, uh, use the high throughput. Uh, analysis to do this. Uh, you can use the attribute analysis to do uh, to find for drugs that are capable of improving your splicing defect, and then you can use these drugs to actually obtain a functional test for uh, the uh, disease uh, characteristic that you want to correct, and then you can, of course, try and go in preclinical trials and finally get to the bedside. Uh, so this is just the perspectives, and these are the people who have participated in the work. Uh, so nothing could have been done without the help of uh, uh, the people in Udine, who are the rare, uh, the, the, the international or Italian regional center for rare diseases. They are the one who gave us the patients, and uh, the Teleton Foundation in Italy, where uh, that gave us the money to do the job. And of course, the high throughput. Uh, 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 group in, uh, uh, in, in Trieste that uh, is allowing the, this, this facility to, to be used for, for this purpose. And with this, I thank you, and uh, the RNA course is over. <laughs> 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 Thanks.